Thank you for being here. Um, before we start with satellite, I would like to acknowledge the Yugura people and the Turabul people as the traditional custodian of me and Jean, the land on which we gather today. And I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. So my name is Marlene Bra. I'm uh, the director of the HIV programs and advocacy department at IS, and I have a pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers uh, today. Uh, the first one is uh, Viva Healthcare, who has kindly uh, sponsored this uh, satellite. And the second one is uh, Gilead, who has been uh, sponsoring the publication of this uh, supplement. I just would like to flag that um, VIS uh, staff, for the editors of the journal and the sponsor did not have any influence over the selection of the papers, the publication process, and all the views presented today are the author's views. So this supplement was guest edited by um, Rina Danamnyensuk. Yeah. Great, I nailed it, apparently, from the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation in Thailand by Jeffrey Lazarus for the Barcelona Institute for Global Health in Spain and by Georgina Caswell from the Global Network of People Living with HIV in South Africa. We would like to thank them because it was a labor of love. We also would like to thank all our authors who are here with us today. And I also would like to thank my team, the uh, editorial team of the Journal of International Aid Society, as well as the person-centered care uh, program team who is in the room with us today. Today, we will have uh, two moderators, Jeffrey uh, and Rina, and uh, they've been doing an amazing work uh, as I was saying, really a labor of love, of love, and they will today moderate the session. Jeffrey Lazarus is a professor at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, and he's the head of the Health System Research Group at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. He currently serves as co-chair of the HIV Outcomes Beyond Viral Suppression Coalition. And Rina, Jan Yamnyatsuk is the Program Manager for Transgender Health at the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation in Bangkok, Thailand, where she established the Tangerine Community Health Clinic, the first transgender-led health clinic in the region. She manages and provides technical guidance for the development and implementation of HIV research and programs for transgender populations. So without further ado, I'm going to let the stage and let you uh, listen to our great offers and our great papers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malan, for your kind introduction. And good evening, good afternoon, everyone. So it's my pleasure to be part of this satellite session. So I would like to thank the organizer, the JIAS, and the People Center Care team for uh, having having made this session possible. So. Um, before I start, here's my conflict of interest disclosure. And uh, before we go into the, the session, I would like to share with you a little bit about the background of this session and the, the supplement. So despite advances made by health system to improve the care of people living with HIV, a higher burden of multimorbidity and poorer health related quality of life are reported by many people living with HIV in comparison to people without HIV. In addition to that, the World Health Organization consolidated HIV guidelines includes guidance on task sharing, task shifting, integration and decentralization of services to promote the highest quality person-centered delivery of care for people living with and affected by HIV. However, gaps in implementation science evidence to support this guidance exist. So the objective of this um, JIS supplement is to spotlight the latest evidence, best practices, and community perspectives from around the world related to person-centered care approaches. And the second objective is to enable research groups to share developments around implementing the components of person-centered care in their unique settings. So in the past year, I think we have been able to have a uh, 
many publications submitted, but finally, uh, a few weeks ago, we have 10 publications successfully launched um, in, on the 6th of July, which is the, um, this month, which include one editorial, five original research articles, two viewpoints, one short report, and another commentary. And here's one of the, the messages that the, the guest editors would want to highlight in the editorial. People's Center Health System are programs of care that provides individuals, families, and community with humanistic, holistic, and trusted health care that must be acceptable and responsive to the needs, rights, and preferences of people living with HIV and key populations. So here are the key, uh, the four key takeaway messages from all of us that we want to emphasize. The first message is around the meaningful and sustained engagement. Person-centered care systems require meaningful and sustained engagement between stakeholders, co-design approaches, and feedback mechanism. Next, people-centered care system result in higher retention in care and better HIV outcomes. Healthcare providers encounter barriers to implementing person-centered care and the transition to integrated and person-centered care system require a systematic shift that addresses inequity in all its form and for all stakeholders involved. Lastly, as HIV has evolved into a manageable chronic disease, person-centered care system should move beyond merely focusing on acuity and instead champion well-being. And this is uh, lastly um, with the conclusion that I think it's time for the HIV field to once again raise its banner as a champion towards equity in healthcare and strive for the accelerated and universal shift towards person-centered health system globally. And without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Jeffrey Lazarus. Uh, he's a professor at the City University of New York Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy and the Head of Health System Research Group at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. He's currently served as the co-chair of the HIV Outcome Beyond Viral Suppression Coalition. And he's the author of more than 300 publications, including global consensus statement on HIV and health system which follow up a landmark proposal for a fourth NIT in HIV monitoring, which focus on quality of life. And Jeff talk will be, sorry, too many documents. A people-centered approach to enhance the long-term health and well-being of people living with HIV in Europe. Please welcome Jeff. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Rena, and thank you both for being a, a co-editor of this issue, and to Georgina Caspo, who's, who's not with us right now. Um, and thank you, really, Emma and the team. And I really appreciate that, that you know, the Journal of the International AIDS Society would dedicate an entire issue to people-centered health systems. I'm going to speak um, a little bit about um, our work from HIV outcomes in Europe, although I think much of it is relevant for um, for the rest of the world. Now, we're all very familiar with the new WHO strategy. I spent 11 years working at WHO. That's sort of, let's say, my conflict, my disclosure at least. But I, I think you know, WHO has done an amazing job with the, new, with the new strategy for 2022 to 2030 in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. It calls for a focus to reach the most affected um, and at risk of HIV AIDS to address inequities as they prevent the world from ending the HIV and AIDS epidemic language right out of the UN AIDS um, strategy. You know, it's talking about a more holistic, people-centered HIV care approach focused on the long-term well-being, addressing health-related quality of life, multimorbidity, multimorbidity um, in people living with HIV, and importantly, stigma, as well as discrimination. Now, this is what the treatment of care, sort of the care cascade, the continuum of care looks like 
in the new strategy. So it's the three 90s um, that we're familiar with. But importantly, I'll draw your attention to the three bullet points at the bottom. These are additional key outcomes which have been included um, in the WHO strategy for the first time. The rapid treatment right after diagnosis, engagement in differentiated and chronic care, and importantly, achieving good health-related quality of life. It took us to 2022 to get that language into the strategy, a lot of advocacy from a lot of people around the world to get quality of life mentioned. Now, the shortcoming, I think, of this strategy is that while, while it makes a commitment to health-related quality of life, um, I'm just gonna move this down, it, it doesn't look at how we're going to monitor this. And we know how important monitoring has been in the response to the HIV and AIDS epidemics. And yet while mentioning health-related quality of life, there's nothing about monitoring. So that's really the main message of my talk. And one of the main messages of my research in recent years is trying to get quality of life not only on the agenda, but also measured so that governments are reporting back and we know how well we're doing in terms of quality of life and what it, indeed it means to have good health-related um, quality of life. So, you know, we're aware that there's been a paradigm shift. This is a new era for HIV care. The Brisbane Conference has made that so far um, very apparent to all of us. Although we haven't achieved the three 90s, as was just mentioned by Brent and colleagues in the plenary session, and we're far behind in some parts of the world and even further behind with certain populations, overall, we're making um, good progress. So we can think about a paradigm shift where we're talking about not dying from HIV or AIDS, but actually living long and well with HIV. And again, a lot of my research and work is focused in the European setting. We're not there yet, but we are starting to move from a disease-centered HIV care approach to a people-centered HIV care approach. And that was really the theme of this special issue of JIAS, where we asked researchers and advocates and people with lived experience from around the world um, to tell their story and to report their research on people or person-centered um, health systems. <clears throat> Rena already mentioned, and many of you are familiar with, the global consensus statement on advancing the long-term well-being of people living with HIV. A group of us from around the world, some of you are in the room, prepared this really to also advocate to UNAIDS and WHO before the new strategy, the importance of addressing long-term well-being and in particular, multi-morbidity, self-reported health-related quality of life, and not just stigma, but also um, discrimination. Um, our recommendations focused on monitoring comorbidities, not just being aware of them, not just addressing them in clinical settings, but having health systems monitor the key comorbidities of addressing frameworks for healthy aging, frailty, functional ability. I know Giovanni Guaraldi, who's been leading some of this work, is speaking in a parallel session here, but um, we all need to be thinking about these other frameworks as well always how we can be reducing access barriers for marginalized and vulnerable groups, and how to collect and document um, a health-related quality of life. You know, Graham Brown was discussing this earlier with POSQUAL. There's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of validated tools for people living with HIV to report their health-related quality of life. We need to standardize this. We need, just like with the 390s, to have simple tools so we can be measuring this and then devising interventions that will really address this so everyone living with HIV can have good health-related quality of life as they report it. And finally, as always, not just dis decreasing stigma, but addressing discrimination. And in Europe, we've been particularly addressing that in healthcare settings where we think we can and should be eliminating that um, right away. A new framework was recently launched called the Long-Term Success Framework, and it looks at some aspects that we're always familiar with, like a sustained undetectable viral load, minimal impact of treatment and clinical monitoring, but again, also optimizing health-related quality of life, lifelong integration of healthcare, and a stigma and discrimination-free society. So I know my time is running out, and as co-chair, I'm gonna try and respect that. So I won't go through all the details of this framework, just draw your attention to it, 
and then tell you about some of the work we're doing in Europe. In Europe, each year we've been lucky enough on World AIDS Day to present inside the European Parliament priorities from the communities across the European Union, but also the larger WHO European region. We've been addressing issues around non-communicable diseases, including mental health. We've been presenting new frameworks for HIV care. We've been calling for the routine screening of all relevant um, comorbidities, um, as mentioned. Um, our second area has been addressing aging with HIV and how to enhance long-term health and well-being among people living with HIV. We've asked the European Union to fund more pilot studies, to have more training programs um, for caregivers, and to have specialized integrated health care services addressing comorbidities. Our third area of focus in Europe has been the measuring of patient-reported outcomes and the monitoring of health-related quality of life. We've asked for more funding to be allocated to this as it's not well-funded and therefore not well carried out. We've asked for annual surveys of people with HIV to be looking at stigma discrimination issues and to be integrating PROMS into clinical practice. We need to make sure that clinicians see the value of PROMS. It's not just to understand the dimensions and domains where there's lower health-related quality of life, but what does it mean in a particular um, clinical setting? And hopefully we can come back to that with the clinicians that are in the room during the question and answers. And finally, we continue to address um, stigma and discrimination, a whole series of recommendations to the European Union, to national and regional health authorities, as well as to HIV clinics and care providers. So the priority areas in Europe that we've highlighted and that we've advocated inside the European Parliament address PROMs and PREMs, so both patient-reported outcome measures and patient-reported experience measures, that systems are people-centered and integrated, that we have more availability of digital health tools, making sure that we don't augment the digital divide and that we don't leave anyone behind as we rush into digital care and that we recognize the importance of social determinants of health and inequity. So on that, let me end this short presentation and pass back to you, Rina. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jay, for helping us set the stage around people center approaches and frameworks. So let's moving to the next uh, speaker, Jane Kabami. Jane has worked in HIV care and HIV related research activities for 19 years. Currently, she is a program manager and an investigator of the Shafai study, which is accelerating the path to HIV elimination with new innovative combination strategies for HIV prevention and treatment that are effective, efficient, scalable, and reduce HIV incidence. She's also a member of the National HIV NCD Technical Working Groups at the Uganda Ministry of Health. So Jane will join us online. Jane. Hello, my name is Jane Kawami from the Infectious Diseases Research Collaboration in Uganda. And I'll be presenting a person-centered dynamic trace prevention in rural Kenya and Uganda, a such a first study. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. And the objective is to evaluate the uptake of a person-centered dynamic choice prevention, which is the DCP model, among persons at risk of HIV identified at, at natal clinics, at patient departments, and in the community in rural Uganda and Kenya, the such trial. Client-centered care in all situations of providers a client interaction in the SAFIRE study refers to respect to um, the participant warmth and genuine concern of our participants, responsiveness to clients' preferences, values and needs, active collaboration and shared decision making between client and provider, and physical and emotional comfort to our participants. As our background think about HIV prevention interventions, our coverage is still suboptimal among persons at risk of HIV, highlighting the need of innovative approaches to increase HIV prevention coverage. And using the PRECEED framework, we developed a person-centered dynamic choice uh, HIV prevention delivery model that offers a structured choices in product, HIV test modality, location of service delivery, and these were provided together with person-centered staffing, service provision, and client support. Important to note is that we put the person or the client at the center of everything that we do 
including a planning where to provide the service from, what kind of service is appropriate for them, who is providing the service, and when it is appropriate to provide this service to the client. In terms of our methodology, our population included adults aged 15 years and above who were HIV negative and at risk of HIV. Our settings included antenatal clinics and outpatient departments where we conducted individual randomized trials. And our third setting was the community where our intervention was delivered by community health workers, all VHTs, and this was a cluster randomized trial. The primary outcome was by medical covered time, and this is coverage. And we looked at the proportion of participants selecting each DCP option at each scheduled visit. We also looked at the percentage of follow-up time for which a participant reported the use of PrEP or PEP, and this was assessed over 24 years. Our secondary outcome was percentage of follow-up time at risk of HIV for which a participant was covered with PrEP or PEP. Uh, this uh, describes uh, the person-centered dynamic choice a prevention delivery model in detail, and it has um, mainly uh, three major components. One is the education and discussion of the concept of patient-centered care uh, with uh, participants, and this was done by our staff uh, following a detailed training. The next component is providing the um, DCP package itself, and this includes risk assessment and the choice of uh, product that a client is interested in, the HIV testing modality, the service delivery site uh, where the client feels comfortable receiving uh, the service from, the refill duration. And these were integrated into AMC and OPD clinics and were also provided through routine community health work visits within the communities. Reproductive health and gender-based violence services were equally provided to our participants and we provided um, a phone check-in for participants uh, one week after starting new prevention products uh, in our intervention. Um, um, our results, we had a total of 612 participants uh, who were randomized to the person-centered dynamic choice prevention intervention. Uh, 203 were from ANC. 197 were OPD, 212 were from the community. We delivered uh, the DCP intervention in all the three settings successfully, and in ANC, we had 39% uh, of our participants being pregnant, and median age was 24 years. In OPD, 39% were male, median age was 27 years. In the community, 42% were male, and median age was 29 years. Personal preferences for off-site visits increased over time, um, from 35% at baseline to 65% at week 24. Um, interest in alternative HIV testing modalities grew over time uh, from 38% at baseline, who chose self testing, um, versus 58% at week 24. The graph on my right um, shows the different uh, choices of uh, products at the different visits uh, from baseline to week 24. The green is um, participants who chose PrEP. Um, blue is participants who chose PEP. Um, yellow are participants who chose condoms. And pink are participants who chose uh, no product choice at all. Um, and we look at uh, the different settings. And we note that uh, we have the highest number of uh, participants who chose PrEP over time in the ANC trial uh, compared to the community trial. Overall, the mean by medical covered time was 80% for ANC, 60% OPD, and 32% uh, for the community. Um, in this slide, uh, we show um, heat maps for the three uh, settings um, indicating um, coverage of PrEP and PEP over time for participants that were at risk uh, of HIV. Each row represents a participant and each column represents a month. So we note that in the ANC trial, we have most participants uh, were covered uh, by PrEP and PEP while at risk, and that is green, a uh, white pink uh, signifies participants who were at risk but were not covered by PrEP and PEP, and those are the minority in the ANC trial. 
and yellow uh, indicates participants were not at risk but uh, chose to take PrEP or PEP, while blue uh, indicates participants who were at risk and did not take uh, PEP or PrEP. Uh, what is important to note is that um, the choices are differ over time and this is because uh, sometimes participants are at risk and other times they're not at risk. And so when you follow them up over time, you're able to note um, that for the participants who were at risk, in most cases, uh, they were covered by PrEP or PEP. Um, think about the dynamic prevention choice uh, model again, we see that it increased self-reported by medical HIV prevention coverage uh, to week 48. And um, uh, looking at ANC, we notice a 40% increase in biomedical coverage um, prevention, OPD, the 29.2%, and the community was at 27.5%. In conclusion, a person-centered and model cooperating structured choice in biomedical prevention and care delivery options in diverse settings was responsive to varying personal preferences over time in HIV prevention programs. This interim analysis demonstrated the intervention was successfully delivered in settings that are entry points for HIV prevention and that can be adopted as new prevention options such as Kabel A become available. In the next, uh, in this next season, we are looking at an extension of um, the three ongoing trials with the addition of Cabotagrava uh, as a product choice. And here we are evaluating um, the effect of the DCP intervention with the addition of Kabel A. Uh, on biomedical coverage compared to standard of care, and we shall do a rigorous evaluation through 48 weeks extension of these three randomized trials. Our second objective is to optimize implementation in the real world setting, and this evaluation will be done using the REAIM framework. I'd like to uh, acknowledge our study participants and communities in both Kenya and Uganda. The principal investigators are Professors Diane Havri, Moses Kamia, Maya Peterson, the SAT study team, and the different collaborators, and most importantly, um, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, specifically Melanie Macon, uh, for their support um, to the implementation of this study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane, for joining us virtually and for staying online for the Q&A session. So for the a little note, are we going to have another two presentations and then we're going to have a Q&A session for the first part. So moving to our next speaker, Njegwa Mugamba. Uh, Njegwam works for the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia as implementation coordinator for person Center care study. Njegwa coordinated the process evaluation component of better information for health in Zambia, which led to the formulation of the Better Info Toolkit. He's also coordinated qualitative and health economics components of the person-centered care study. So Njegwa is going to present about the patterns of people-centered communications and provider perspectives to inform the design and implementation of a facility-based improvement intervention in HIV clinics in Zambia. Njegwa, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Njegwa, as I have been well introduced, and um, implementation coordinator from the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia. I would like to begin by really expressing thanks to the organizers of this uh, satellite, but also to really express thanks to the recipients of care, as well as the healthcare workers who participated in our study. I also wish to take this opportunity to recognize the support that we receive, as it were, from our partners, the Zambian Minister of Health, as well as our funder, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I do not have any conflict of interest to declare. And basically, this is the way we'll flow. I will begin with uh, sharing our findings from the provider perspective on person-centered care, and then I'll move on to patterns of person-centered care com communication in public HIV uh, clinics, and this was really implemented in Zambia. So by way of uh, a beginning, we 
implemented the PCPH trial that was in 2019 to 2021. This was basically a stepped wage design, which was a randomized trial uh, of an intervention. And the idea was to improve person-centeredness of HIV care across the 24 uh, government-run health facilities in Zambia. We started with a formative uh, research, which was meant to design the intervention. And then we basically went into the main trial. As you can see, the trial had three key components. Firstly, there was the capacity building of healthcare workers. Then we had uh, client-centered metrics. And then we also had some quality improvement initiatives, which were also supported with gentle facility incentives. We had multiple outcomes. And then our study essentially had positive effects on client uh, experience as well as retention. We did not see any effect on viral loads. We defined PCC basically as treating clients as equal partners in planning, in development, as well as in monitoring care. I now move on to our formative work where we looked at provider perspectives on person-centeredness. Our work was published in the JIS supplement so by way of background, key to successful implementation requires healthcare workers' perception of accept acceptability, appropriateness, as well as feasibility. And <laughs> evidence basically shows that uh, for you to have effective implementation of, this, of, of, of PCC, you really need to have healthcare workers who would consider this to be acceptable, appropriate. But what data shows us is that this is indeed limited in sub-Saharan Africa. And what we sought to do was to understand healthcare workers' perception on beliefs, on perceptions, but also on the motivation for them to practice PCC. The idea being to inform the main trial. So we set out to uh, conduct a focus group discussion. We conducted eight of them and immediately did some rapid analysis in order to inform the main trial. Some of the results are as follows. Basically, healthcare workers endorsed the concept of PCC. Of course, there were some uh, expressed challenges with, uh, you know, limited organizational as well as infrastructure. And for us as a study, we saw the opportunity really to uh, develop an intervention that will acknowledge, of course, the conditions under which the healthcare workers were working. The healthcare workers were, in a sense, motivated by you know, positive client outcomes, but what undermined their motivation was really you know, power dynamics that would exist you know, among themselves. And therefore, as an intervention, we needed to consider some frustration management strategies. And then the healthcare workers gladly accepted the client uh, experience data that we shared with them, but clearly did not have the capacity for them to analyze the data. And that is something that a study needed to pay close attention as we moved into the trial. Our calls to action. What we're saying basically is intervention should really target organizational as well as structural you know, barriers that would inhibit uh, PCC practice, among which would, of course, include uh, policies and facility dynamics. But also, it's extremely important to really focus not only on the client, but also on the providers as we think of person-centered care. And I'll move on very quickly to the work that we did in order to clearly understand the service delivery outcomes of person-centered care. Sorry. Our work again is published in the GIS supplement. So poor client experience as well as a poor client provider communication are potential barriers along with so many other factors to long-term engagement in care. However, standardized you know, assessment or metrics to measure this are quite limited in the sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And what we did was we used the rota inter interaction analysis system to basically characterize patterns of person-centered communication behaviors in Zambia. We enrolled uh, people living with HIV who were making a routine HIV follow-up visit uh, along with their providers. 
and we trained staff who coded the data using the RIAS uh, schema. And basically what the RIAS schema does is that it classifies each client and provider utterance or talk into one of the 37 mutually exclusive categories. And after coding, we basically performed latent class analysis. Our data basically shows that we had more females and we had more clinical officers among providers and most of our, 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 our interactions or the, the, the surveys were actually drawn from medium-sized health facilities. We identified four uh, profiles, distinct profiles of client-provider communication. And the first one basically shows us that about 48% of interactions were predominantly medical. The second profile basically shows us that about 21% of the interactions had a balance of between medical as well as you know, psychosocial topics, but of course with very low PCC behaviors. Our third uh, profile shows about 24% of the interactions were characterized by medical uh, talk, but of course greater use of you know, PCC behaviors. And lastly, about 7.5% of the interactions uh, showed both medical as well as psychosocial uh, topics, of course, with a greater use of the PCC uh, behaviors. When we analyze the data by looking at the interaction of a uh, healthcare provider uh, as well as the type, what came out was that nurses were actually more client-centered. <coughs> How must we conclude? Clearly, we can see that client-provider communication mainly focused on medical topics and, you know, person-centered communication clearly still needs, you know, some attention. But what we are glad to see is the feasibility of the same in our context. Of course, integration of PCC behaviors, you know, varied across, you know, the cadres as well as uh, the providers. And what is important is to improve, you know, PCC behaviors in order for us to have sustained uh, client experience and long-term engagement in, in care. What are some of our calls to action? There's really need for systems for positive reinforcement of non-medical uh, communication. But also a pragmatic way of doing this is in fact deliberately building the capacity of healthcare providers and also mentoring them in good communication. But therein also lies an opportunity, a research opportunity in fact, to understand the changes in client provider communication over time, but also how those relate to uh, retention. How must I quickly conclude? Uh, currently, CIDAS has continued with the implementation of uh, uh, person-centered you know, care. And what, we, what is happening currently is that we are collaborating with the Zambian Ministry of Health to look at strategies to uh, integrate you know, PCC in national health policy, as well as you know, in, 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 in other you know, guidelines. And what we've done is we've signed uh, a letter of agreement with the ministry in which we have committed ourselves to supporting the training of healthcare workers, to provide the PCC curriculum, and also seek to integrate PCC in the national health policy. We've also contributed to the development of the client satisfaction tool, and we have, based on our interaction, also assisted or contributed to uh, having PCC as a theme for this year's National Quality Improvement Conference. And lastly, I must say that uh, we are in the process of developing a sustainable PCC activity package. And what will happen with this is that we will have different stakeholders brought together, recipients of care, implementers at district, province, as well as health decision makers to be able to, you know, develop this PCC sustainable package. May I take this opportunity yet again to express thanks to our recipients of care, the Zambian Ministry of Health, our funder Bill and Melinda Gates, and all the other collaborating partners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Njekwa, for sharing with us your amazing work from Zambia. So moving to our next speaker before we're going to have a Q&A. So um, our next speaker is Davina 
Kanagasabe Davina is an HIV and global health practitioner with more than 14 years of experience providing technical and management oversight to HIV and organizational capacity building projects across 18 countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Davina currently serves as a senior technical advisor with PATH Primary Healthcare Program, supporting HIV and TB HIV projects in the Democratic Republic of Congo, India, Kenya, Myanmar, Uganda, and Vietnam. Davina. Thank you, Reina, and um, hello, everyone. Um, and I am delighted to be here on behalf of my co-authors to share our experience under the USAID-funded PATH-led Integrated HIV AIDS Project in Okatanga um, to co-create a client service quality feedback process to facilitate delivery of person-centered HIV care. I have no conflict of, conflicts of interest to disclose. And so our aim in embarking on this work was to create a tool to gather and use client feedback to adapt services to be responsive to client needs while improving client satisfaction with services received. Uh, we tested our system at eight high volume facilities uh, supported by the USAID PATH IHAP HK project over 17 months from May 2021 through September 2022, with the objective of really understanding the feasibility and effectiveness of our system in identifying and addressing quality of care gaps as reported by clients. So before diving into the details of our work, I just wanted to take a moment to share how we were approaching the concept of person-centered HIV care, which we defined as services that are informed by and respect the express preferences um, of people living with HIV. And um, so the literature is clear that comprehensive community engagement across all aspects of programming from design through implementation and monitoring um, is required to deliver high quality and responsive services that engage and keep clients engaged in healthcare. And that it's really clients themselves that need to be driving person-centered care. And so understanding clients' experience and satisfaction with services received has been a key aspect of our project's continuous quality improvement process. However, in the past, um, we had um, more passive paper-based tools to gather feedback, which um, resulted in a very time-consuming data collection compilation process um, and ultimately did not yield much useful information to really to get at those core um, issues in a timely manner. Um, so with this tool, we were really seeking to create a more active method for gathering client feedback. So in designing our tool, it was really important for us to ensure that clients and providers were integrally involved throughout the process so that the final tool produced was feasible and focused on care issues that were most important to clients. And so we applied elements from PATH's Living Labs approach to co-create the service quality feedback tool, starting with a mapping exercise um, to identify 20 stakeholders that were involved throughout the co-creation process, um, including people living with HIV, um, as well as community and facility-based service providers. We used um, empathy maps to identify pain points um, that clients encountered while receiving services, um, and then used this information um, along with inputs from focus group discussions to define aspects of service delivery that our tool would focus on. Um, during focus group discussions, we also identified um, preferred attributes uh, for the client feedback mechanism, uh, with the group opting uh, to use an anonymous uh, post-appointment exit interviews um, administered by peers um, digitally. The project then used all these inputs to design a prototype, uh, working with um, clients to then develop the actual survey questions based on pain points that were identified during the discover phase. And so to ensure that the issues raised by clients were um, actually systematically addressed, uh, we embedded this tool into our project's uh, CQI system. And so to really create that continuous service quality monitoring feedback loop as shown on the slide. Um, so after the survey was developed, uh, we, devel um, we programmed the final questions into the digital survey um, with the exit interviews then offered and administered um, to consenting clients by 30 uh, trained peer educators. Um, and project staff then ex exported uh, client responses on a weekly basis uh, to share with facility quality improvement teams and peer educators who then worked to identify um, some of the most critical quality of care gaps. 
um, project staff, facility QI teams, and peer educators um, then jointly brainstorm solutions uh, to address the identified quality challenges. And these were integrated into facility um, level QI plans for implementation and then ongoing monitoring. Um, so our service quality questionnaire um, centered really around three key areas that were raised by clients, uh, so which was wait time, medication dispensing, provider um, attitude and confidentiality, um, and viral load services. Um, so over the 17 months that this tool was used, uh, we gathered feedback from more than 4,900 exit interviews um, and long wait times, reported stigma, um, perceived confidentiality, and viral load services were highlighted as the core service quality issues that QI teams and peer educators need to focus on. So shifting over to results, um, so to address long wait times, um, the solutions that were implemented by the facility QI teams um, included using peer educators to uh, conduct appointment prep tasks, um, coaching providers to use appointment agendas to, for improved service triage, um, and then improving uh, waiting room conditions. And these solutions led to both um, a reduction in maximum as well as average wait time, as uh, shown on the figure, um, as well as an increase in reported client satisfaction with wait time. Uh, from 76% of clients reporting wait time to be excellent or acceptable at baseline, compared to 100% at headline. Solutions to address stigma and confidentiality um, in, um, included removing indication of HIV status on facility access cards, um, as well as limiting um, individuals permitted in consultation rooms during appointments. This led to an increase in the proportion of clients reporting provider attitudes to be excellent or very good over time, and also improved perceptions of confidentiality, with 99% of clients reporting services to be delivered in a confidential manner at endline compared to 71% at baseline. And finally, our work to um, improve viral load services was really focused on how to reduce the turnaround time between sample collection and results returned to clients with implemented solutions, including daily follow-up with the referral laboratories to ensure timely analysis, um, and then um, immediately informing clients of their results through text, phone call, or home visit. And these solutions led to both an increase in the number of clients informed of fire load results, as well as an increase in the number of results returned within one month of sample collection, uh, which is a feat in Okatonga province where there are only two labs um, providing services to more than 70,000 people living with HIV. And so um, to conclude, our use of the service quality feedback system um, proved to be feasible to administer and effective at quickly identifying um, service delivery aspects that were not aligned with client needs um, and deploy solutions that led to improved perception of service quality. Um, the system has a strong potential to be a promising mechanism for advancing uh, person-centered HIV services in the DRC, although further testing um, is needed uh, both to better understand acceptability and cost-effectiveness of the model um, as part of informing future scale-up. Um, and so I just wanted to end with this quote from one of our peer educators who are involved in conducting the exit interviews, um, Lillian, who um, highlights how helpful the system really was to understand clients' complaints and then apply solutions to rapidly access, address these quality issues. And so um, I would like to acknowledge some folks who are really critical to making this work happen, including our donors, PEPFAR and USAID, uh, the National HIV Program, all the stakeholders involved in our co-creation process, and um, my fellow co-authors on the IHAPHK project who really led this work um, in the DRC. And then most importantly, the 30 peer educators who really drove um, the service quality feedback system and enabled us to deliver person-centered um, services for people living with HIV in Okatanga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Davina, for your impressive work. It's a very good thing for us to learn and adapt in our context. So now I think I'm, I'm so sorry we don't have enough time for the Q&A, so hopefully we're going to have the, another session um, for the second part. So now it's my time to turn the microphone to Jeff to be the co-moderator co for the rest of the speakers. Jeff. Thanks, Rena, and thank you to everyone who's spoken so far. Our next speaker is Esther Nkolo. Esther has 15 years of, of public health experience in Africa, including firsthand programming experience. I'm in a broad range of, of health areas, including pediatrics, um, HIV, pediatric HIV, and continuous quality improvement. And she recently won PEPFAR's Lifetime Achievement Award. So over to you, Esther. Good day. My name is Dr. Ankolo Esther. 
I'm pleased to share with you our work on improving clinical outcomes for clients on preferred differentiated ART in Uganda. I'll start with a brief background on the context and subsequently explain what we see from the data and how we have adapted the program for impact. The Ugandan Ministry of Health began piloting and scared, scaling up differentiated art services in 2016, becoming one of the first sub-Saharan African countries to develop and implement a comprehensive national DST program. DST models are incorporated in the national treatment guidance, guidelines and over 95% of the 1.3 million Ugandans living with HIV on treatment are enrolled in the different models offered. Over time, innovative models have emerged provided through group settings, that is the blue box. These are managed by a health worker or by people living with HIV. We also have various individual models based at the facility or in the community shown in the red text boxes on the right. These provide confidential space for ARV drug refills. Multi-month ARV dispensing is included in DSD and is offered to people living with HIV from two years old who have been on treatment for one month or more. The aim of the DSD models is to promote person-centered service delivery in which the diverse preferences, needs, and expectations of clients are taken into consideration, allowing for reduced visits to a health facility, enhanced quality of care, improved treatment outcomes for clients, and redirecting of resources to focus on those most at need for, of the most intensive support. While we have made significant strides in ensuring clients have options available to meet their individual needs, we realize that intentionally engaging clients in the decision-making process on what models work best for them is not consistently done. In early 2022, we conducted a client preference survey with over 6,000 participants in 113 health facilities across nine regions in Uganda. Our findings showed that only 75% of participants were in, the prefer in their preferred DSD models at the time. Findings were similar between the male, that is the green, and the female participants were shown with purple. We found that attachment to a community resource person or group is associated with fewer missed appointments, that is the green bar on the left, updated viral load, the yellow bar, and viral load suppression, the purple bar. Most patients not on preferred DSD model, preferred community-based models. Overall, we found that clients in their preferred DSD model shown in the upper row have better clinical outcomes than clients not in their preferred DSD model. The rate of missed appointments was lower at 29% for clients on their preferred DSD model compared to 40% among clients not enrolled in the DSD model of their choice. Our survey determined whether clients eligible for viral load had received a repeated viral load test. We discovered that clients on their preferred DSD model had an up-to-date viral load result. DSD-related interventions to support viral load monitoring like community bleeding com could explain in part the observed result and help address barriers to viral load testing like long distances and costs associated with travel to the health facility. This was helpful during the COVID pandemic and lockdowns. Furthermore, viral load suppression was higher among clients on their preferred model at 87% compared to clients not on their preferred model at 68%. Men in their preferred model compared to men not in their preferred model also had fewer missed appointments, that's in blue, more updated viral load in yellow, and suppressed viral loads shown in purple. The female participants showed the same trend. Looking at the models, we see that community models reported less missed appointments compared to facility-based models. This is largely attributed to increased barriers to HIV care at a facility level from the provider, client, and health system perspective, such as frequent clinic visits for clinic evaluations and drug refills, and also long waiting times. Integrating client preference and attachment to a community support person or platform in DSD offers the potential for improving HIV treatment outcomes. 
These preferences, approaches, and tools are now integrated as routine practice and quality of care improvement efforts to ensure person-centered care and client autonomy. However, an important lesson learned is that programs need to implement these strategies at scale and with fidelity to realize impact on retention and health outcomes. On the left, we see improvement in reducing interruption in treatment at a program level across all USAID-supported districts. That's the red line. The impact on re-engaging returning clients who missed appointments only started to show recently, partly because assessing patient preference was not fully incorporated in the counseling sessions at scale earlier. However, on the right, we show a region where we scaled up these approaches across all sites much earlier. We see a substantial reduction in treatment interruption and re-engagement of most returning clients. Since we know that putting patients on their preferred DSD model improves patient outcomes, we have introduced an audit tool that, showed us, that shows us service coverage gaps at scale. This is a screenshot of what the tool looks like at a site level. It's a patient level tool used for micro planning at a facility level. In summary, to enhance HIV treatment outcomes, we must put people and communities at the center of our work. We need to offer services that are designed to respond to the specific needs of those most vulnerable. Client preference varies and circumstances evolve, thus requiring healthcare providers to adjust the model of service delivery when needed. Using the audit tool helps program manage patient preference at scale. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Esther. And now Maggie Munsami is going to also join us online. She's a professional health specialist with over 30 years of experience. She's currently the National Health Insurance Technical Expert Contracting and the head of CCMDD, which won the South African Public Sector Innovator um, Award of the Year for 2021. She'll be speaking on integrated care, including hypertension and diabetes issues I find incredibly interesting. So I look forward to your talk, Maggie. Hello, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to speak to you about the person set in integrated non-communicable disease and HIV decentralized drug distribution in Iswatini and South Africa. And I am from South Africa. There's no conflict of interest. The purpose today is to promote awareness of successful large-scale NCD and HIV integration projects. We present experiences with person centered models for HIV and NCD integration through the decentralized medication distribution from Iswatini and South Africa. The background to this is that the aging population of people living with HIV has increased and so has the prevalence of non clinical diseases. Despite increasing NCD prevalence, there is a lack of high quality published evidence to support person-centered NCD and HIV integration models in sub-Saharan Africa. Specifically, there is little research on integration of hypertension and diabetes to common NCDs. Integration may increase access to care. So, implement the programmatic data from the Community Health Commodities Distribution, also known as CHCD in Iswatini, was collected from April 2020 to December 2021. And programmatic data from the CCMDD, also known as WAPMED in South Africa, was collected from January 2016 to December 2021. The results from Iswatini, 83 PEPA supported facilities and 721 functional com community distribution points implemented CHC from April 2020 to December 2021, providing over 28,000 people with and without HIV with integrated services, including multi-disease screening, HIV testing, CD4, and viral load testing, arch refills, and PrEP alongside NCD services, including blood pressure and glucose monitoring, hypertension and diabetes medication refills, and there were no out-of-pocket costs. 
The 26,776 clients enrolled represent people living with and without HIV, 63% female and 4% below 15 years of age. And the common pickup points were under tree, in schools, churches, bus stops, community hall, football pitches and shops. Only 1% of CHCD patients missed their appointments in the program, compared to 7% who missed appointments for facility-based referrals. Less than 10% of all the clients receiving art from facilities that conduct CHCD collected medication from pickup points. The challenge from Iswatini some people living with HIV require more comprehensive medical management, continue to prefer facility-based care. Due to the supply chain difficulties resulting in low NCT medication supply, clients sometimes purchase from private pharmacies or receive the one month supply from CHCD. The lack of funding for client transportation is another challenge. And then lastly, financial stability. We all need the funding. So our next talk about South Africa, the CCMD program is a flagship for the national health insurance that provides an alternative access to chronic medication for stable patients. There is two parts to the program. The first one is the dispensing and distribution. And the second point is the external pickup points. So a patient visits a facility and they are stable the facility will script the patient, give the patient the first supply of medication, and then patients can choose where they want to, to collect the next set of medication. The script is then sent to the distribution section, and then patients then will choose where they want to collect their medicine. And then the DND section will then deliver the medicines to where the patient chooses to collect the medicine. There are over 800, uh, sorry, 2,555 contracted pickup points, and patients can choose the pickup points which is closer to the home or workplace. And of the pickup points that is contracted, we have doctors, pharmacies, community pharmacies, corporate pharmacies, and we have the innovation like the smart locker or refurbished containers, and the fast lane which has facility level adherence club and community outreach places. By October 2021, the 2.9 million patients receiving their art of them, 56% 56 56 use the external pickup points, 25% utilize the facility pickup points, and 19% collected from the adherence club. The waiting times at the external pickup points is less than 10 minutes as opposed to collecting from a facility which is ours. These are the list of conditions. The top numbers that you see is hypertension is right on top, followed by diabetes and angina. And also we have the IPT therapy. And then also we have more than 100 conditions on CCMDD. So stigma is a big issue. And what we try to do is to engage more with the patients. And the patients also assisted us to ensure that the package that they pick up is the exact same as an NCD package. So there's no difference between an HIV medicine package or an NCD package. The patients also can choose their own language for the written medication instructions. And they also choose where they want to collect their medicine parcel. The dates are given to the patient with a seven day lead time. And during that time, patients collect their parcels. And feedback from the patients also during our design and implementation and review, the patients also engage with us to tell us what they want on the labeling. And because we have both NCD and art medications together at the pickup points, the patients are not isolated as an art patient or an NCD patient. And then also there is some sort of privacy in the dispensing areas at, at the pickup points. 
So the challenge is in South Africa, in rolling out the web-based system for CCNDD, uh, the lack of internet connectivity impacts the use of the electronic prescribing. Uh, and because we have over 2.9 million patients, it's quite a struggle. And of course, the energy crisis is causing a disruption in electricity is problematic for the program and the country. And due to insufficient storage space at popular pickup points, so when they reach capacity, we need to block them. And when the um, storage normalizes, and then we put them back onto the program. So in conclusion, Eswatini in South Africa demonstrates scalable person-centered models for HIV and NCD integration through decentralized drug distribution. This approach adapts medication delivery to serve individual needs while decongesting health facilities, efficiently delivering NCD care, reducing health care costs borne by clients with multiple comorbidities and decreasing HIV-related stigma. The Ministry of Health Leadership the public-private partnership, NGOs, PEPFAR, international donors, and national treasury are crucial to the success of both programs, as was the absence of out-of-pocket costs to clients. To bolster up the program uptake, additional reporting is required. So the next steps, there is a need for further evaluation for the integrated HIV and NCD drug distribution, which will include analysis of factors uh, patterns of service uptake, analysis of HIV clinical outcomes by mode and demographic factors, the risk factors for loss of viral suppression, and client preference. In addition, reporting of integrated NCD and HIV decentralized drug distribution models is needed on client-level clinical outcomes, including the blood pressure control HIV that will take us to the benchmarks of the 95, 95, 95, and of course, the longer term mortality trends through modeling studies. And with that, I want to say thank you to our contributors. Uh, we had from the USAID office in USA and WHO, we had Eswatini, and we have South Africa. So on that note, I want to say thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Maggie and Brian Minalga. You are in the room and you're the Deputy Director of the Office of HIV AIDS Network Coordination based at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, USA, which supports the global operations of the HIV clinical trials networks. And you lead with a particular focus on ethics and community engagement in clinical research. As a member of trans and non-binary communities, much of your work focuses on transgender representation and justice. Welcome to the podium. All right, phylodynamic modeling at 8 p.m., strap in. We are ready for it. Um, I'm Brian Minalga. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be presenting on behalf of a great team that authored this paper, the abbreviated version of which is Lessons Learned from Community Engagement in HIV Phylogenetic Research. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So by way of background, in 2020, I became aware of a project that was taking place at the University of Washington. I was not involved with the project but it involved a phylodynamic model of HIV transmission. And this model was generating conclusions such as these. Black men have an X percent probability of acquiring or transmitting HIV from or to another black man. And young men have an X percent probability of acquiring or transmitting HIV from or to older men. So I became aware of this project and immediately was very concerned with the stigma associated with these conclusions being drawn from this mathematical model, from this phylodynamic model, and um, particularly because of the inputs of the model itself. So let's back up a little bit and talk about this original study that I was not involved with but became aware of in 2020. The research question being asked in this study was, is there phylogenetic evidence of assortative HIV transmission 
by age, race, or ethnicity among men who have sex with men in King County, Washington, USA. So it turns out that this phylodynamic model was using molecular HIV surveillance data collected through public health surveillance for public health purposes. And um, if we look at these inputs and outputs of the model, so on the input side, you have the HIV sequences collected through surveillance, once again, for public health purposes, and the linked data associated with these genetic sequences of the HIV, including age, race, and ethnicity of the people from whom these sequences were collected. And the outputs of the model were one, to estimate a transmission probability weight for all pairs of HIV sequences, and then to predict population level HIV transmission patterns. So this was the original study. Now at the time, um, I was deeply involved with HIV advocacy around this highly controversial topic of molecular HIV surveillance. So take a moment just to orient yourself to the images um, featured here. You have a protest. I believe this was in 2017 or 18, the United States Conference on AIDS. You had a protest against this practice of molecular HIV surveillance in the US. You have uh, the call for a moratorium, the immediate moratorium on MHS. You have a webinar series called Without Our Consent. You have a variety of um, growing literature, academic literature by bioethicists, by community members, by other really smart people who are concerned with this topic of molecular HIV surveillance. Um, so I have an activism and an advocacy background in this um, global HIV decriminalization movement. I also work in HIV clinical trials where I apply a, an ethical framework and, um, and methodologies of community engagement. And so it's kind of at this nexus of my background in clinical trials and advocacy. I'm even looking at the use of phylogenetic research in HIV clinical research uh, where informed consent is a requirement and um, community engagement is also a component whereby um, the U equals U campaign led by people living with HIV has been informed by phylogenetic research, but differs significantly from the public health use of molecular HIV surveillance. So this is where my experience um, led me to this relatively niche field of HIV molecular epidemiology, phylodynamic research, and related ethical and community focused issues. So here is the timeline back to the original study uh, of these researchers at University of Washington. Um, we did become friends, spoiler alert. So um, we're, we're on the same team here. But the parent grant um, under which this phylodynamic model was funded, it was funded in 2016. They conducted their analysis from 2018 to 2020, and it was around 2020 um, that they met me and we started having these conversations about the community concerns. They were also reading a lot of the publications, um, including from some folks in the room, uh, from this whole period of time from 2016 to 2021, there were increasing number of publications and presentations about community concerns related to molecular HIV surveillance. So the researchers became aware of these concerns and they made a surprising um, turn because at this point in their timeline, they had actually already written their manuscript and were preparing for publication of their phylodynamic model. But after learning of these community concerns, they actually stopped the project. They um, did not submit the manuscript and instead they chose to engage in a community consultation process. So never too late um, is one of our lessons. It's never too late to conduct community engagement. Always better to start early um, but the community consultation process involved a variety of, of um, outreach, the most important of which was with, was with uh, this consultation with a national coalition on molecular HIV surveillance, where um, the researchers asked, what are the perceived benefits of the project? What are the potential harms? And um, this is where I kind of came in and introduced the researchers to this coalition. Um, a lot of issues came out of the community consultation process. And um, I only have seven minutes, so I'm only gonna talk about two of the issues, but one is informed consent. So when we talk about um, research involving people and their data, informed consent is required, right? Well, not exactly, because in this research project about people and their data, the data from the people is actually acquired through surveillance, through public health surveillance, which does not require informed consent. So we have this interesting Venn diagram or loophole 
through which data about people and their uh, medical conditions and their demographic information have been acquired by research through public health and then used in this way. So it calls into question the ethics of conducting such research. And also um, we have the interlocking systems of oppression. So this particular research project was interacting with long-standing systems of oppression such as racism, homophobia, and HIV criminalization. And its outputs only served to reproduce harmful and stigmatizing norms about communities disproportionately affected by HIV with no directly intervenable public health outcomes. So uh, the researchers decided not to publish that original manuscript based on um, three primary questions. These are questions that all researchers can ask of your projects. So question number one, does this research translate into public health action and efforts to end the HIV epidemic? So this is the um, principle of public health utility. Question two, does this research benefit or at minimum not harm communities of people living with HIV who are included in this research, in this case, without their consent? So these are the um, research principles of beneficence and non-maleficence, the ethical principles. And question three, does this research equitably distribute benefits and risks to people living with as well as uh, people susceptible to acquiring HIV? And this is the research principle of justice. Um, in the paper itself, we have a whole table of other considerations for researchers, so I encourage you to check that out. So instead of publishing that original manuscript, um, we actually all teamed up. The researchers from the original project, myself and um, others from the community teamed up to write the paper that is the subject of this supplement and this presentation, Lessons Learned from, Lessons Learned from Community Engagement Regarding Phylodynamic Research Using Molecular HIV Surveillance Data. Um, so the paper itself covers a lot more than I had time to talk about today, the community engagement process, what we learned, the decision not to publish, and recommendations for other researchers. I just want to close by bringing us back to uh, why we're all here. You know, the session is about person-centered approaches to HIV. Sometimes I think we need to remind ourselves that the first letter in HIV is human. And HIV research must never serve to exploit human suffering or disease for academic profit or intrigue. So all things considered, um, all HIV research must always center people. I just wanna end by thanking um, a lot of folks, especially Diana Tordoff, who really led this project, um, the Community Coalition, uh, Positive Women's Network, everyone who contributed to the community engagement process, and also the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which funded this project. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, as an editor of the supplement, that manuscript absolutely fascinated me, and we had a great discussion about it. I've also shared it with editors from, from other journals um, who were so interested in that decision not to publish, but in the end, to publish something else. So thank you for your intervention and, and thank you, uh, you know, to, to the researchers who decided. I'm sure that was a very difficult decision for them, but um, I'm glad you got a publication out of it in the end. Our last speaker, Tung Duan, you're also in the room and you're a self-described young gay man and LGBTI and HIV activist in Vietnam. You're currently the program manager of the Global Network of Young People Living with HIV. Um, y Plus Global and a technical advisor for Lighthouse, a community-led organization in Vietnam. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me in this panel as the young person. And um, um, today I'm represent for the Global Network of Young People with HIV Y Plus Global to present with you about the GIS viewpoint by Y Plus Global and PATA um, on shifting the power dynamic in the delivery of adolescents and youth-friendly health services. Um, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Um, the purpose of the viewpoints um, is to investigate the ideas of the person-centered care in the context of the health service geared towards the adolescent and young people. Um, 
from our team, um, person-centered care referred to an approach in healthcare that strips the power dynamic from the healthcare provider to the patient or service users. It involves engaging patients in decision-making, promoting effective communication, and offering multiple choices and fostering patient empowerment, autonomy, and trust in their healthcare journey. Um, P uh, PCC fundamental principle from our perspective, clients is a unique person. They have a lot of different aspects around them, not just only HIV. Clients should be fully involved in, health, in care and clients must be given the power to make their own decisions. In terms of methodology, PATA and collaborated with Y Plus Global to bring together health providers and adolescents and young people with HIV, creating a unique platform for promoting and enhancing a more equal and empowering relationship between service provider and users. And we also are ready to care scorecard to collect the, the opinions and feedback from young people and use that to inform the healthcare services for young people themselves. Practical strategies and recommendations are informed by joint program implementation and also systematic review of person central care from Y plus global and also PATA um, within the context of HIV treatment setting in sub-Saharan Africa. In terms of lesson learned, there are three um, domains uh, related to person central care from our systematic review and also from our practical experience working with young people. Um, in terms of healthcare provider attitudes, um, the multiple ongoing and layer of sensitization strategy are required um, to make sure that we can have the PCC for um, adolescents and young people with HIV. And there are a tune uh, that proof uh, to be the successful, including uh, value clarification training, supporting health provider to reflect on and redefine their values of working with young people and deliver services for young people and adolescents. Uh, relationship building section to support the health provider to uh, meaningful engage uh, with the young people when they're delivering delivering services for young people. And PCC champions um, to be identifying to lead the process of shifting power and changing the entrance mindset within the health facility. Um, the second lesson learned um, regarding the aspect of peer support, uh, adolescents and young people with HIV peer support are working in partnership with healthcare teams can facilitate a fundamental shift in the healthcare facility power. Um, Engaging young people and people with HIV can break down inequalities and challenge often um, ingrained uh, practice and belief. And uh, we also found that teen clubs and also adolescent friendly safe spaces play a significant role for psychosocial support, counseling and health promotion to improve retention in care and also viral suppression. And effective peer support requires successful health facility integration with mutual agree upon roles and responsibility. Um, the last lesson learned, um, community lead monitoring and service quality improvement. We also found that a community lead monitoring assists the healthcare team and service user to identify the challenges and also develop the quality improvement plans and hence promote the PCC in the healthcare setting. We use the community, so we use the ready to care scorecard as the tool um, to help the community to identify the challenges and also offer the ideas of uh, quality improvement plan for the health facility. Um, adolescents and young people should be involved in the design and also implementation of community monitoring tool. And lastly, health facility and clients should collectively review feedback and um, collaboratively de determine the intervention for action. To conclude, um, strengthening health system to provide PCC requires institutional commitment and also consider implementation across the design roles and also an enabling environment with available resources that respond to the client needs will go a long way to increase the health provider um, intrinsic uh, motivation and attitude to providing person central care. And um, from our team uh, for the next step, we still invest in healthcare staff capacity building. It's really important to make sure that people know about the community, what is their needs and also their languages, how to communicate with the community, sensitization and composition. Uh, engage the community in service supply chain. Community play 
more role rather than just beneficiaries of the services, but we also can deliver services. We can provide the initial counseling, for example. And lastly, facilitate community lead monitoring and continuous quality improvement. It's really important to really have the community in the center of all services to make sure that we listen to them and also re reflect for their needs. Um, I myself acknowledge the team from Wireplus Global and also Pata who co-author for this viewpoint. And thank you very much for IES to hosting in this section. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, um, Tung. We have a few minutes for any questions from the audience. Our virtual presenters are still online, or if any of you all who presented would like to make a comment or have a question for one another. Please. Hello, thanks very much for the great presentations and congratulations to everyone on a really interesting supplement. Um, my question is for Davina, and it, um, Tong kind of asked the question at the end of his presentation in some ways. So I'm really interested in who asks the question. I think that's important. Um, one of the community-led monitoring advocates will always say, you know, if my mother asks me a question, I'll give her one answer. And if my friend asks me the same question, I'll get a different answer. So in terms of the importance of community-led monitoring and communities choosing the questions and asking the questions, I'm wondering how that relates to the work that you presented and who was asking the questions. Thanks. Thanks, Anna, for that question. And yeah, it is so critical who is asking the question. And that is something that came out in our co-design process. Um, and during the process, it was very clear that it was peer educators, um, so peers, pe people living with HIV themselves who were going to administer um, the, the survey. Um, yeah, so thanks, short answer. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments, please? Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Rodrigo. I am one of the co-chairs at the board at GMP Plus, the Global Network of People with HIV. My comment, I mean, uh, it's a very high level and I just really want to say what a fantastic session. Um, thank you for all your contribution and for putting this into the agenda. I mean, basically I just want to just uh, just mention a, a few things about this. I, I truly believe that um, we have heard about the success of all these interventions and and presented today and, 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 and really shows that this model and approach really works, you know, that we need to keep uh, moving towards this direction to create a more effective and responsive services and um, for our communities, you know. Um, I also want to um, say that using a person-centered model approach will help to understand from individuals the different ways and elements and contexts that make it easier for us to access to all those services rather than just really focusing only about the obstacles that we are facing, which it sounds like it's a similar thing, but um, I think I truly believe that it's a different approach when we go to the communities and we ask them truly like, how can we make it easier for you to just access and to stay uh, um, engaged and, and remaining um, uh, in um, accessing to healthcare services? Um, I think as well that it's all about empowerment, um, our empowerment to be in full control of our health and well-being, to make uh, full informed decisions about uh, um, our health, our treatment. And um, yeah, I think from um, a, if we really want to achieve like a, a truly quality of life, high quality of life, we need to just keep asking the communities about this. Um, and that's it. Just thank you so much for, for this amazing um, session. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. You had indicated before the session you wanted to say something, so I appreciate that you got up. Before we end, would anyone like to make a last comment here from the speakers? No? Nope. Rina, any last comment? Great. Now let me thank everyone both for your contributions to this special issue, for coming here, for presenting your work. Everyone online, thank you very much. I appreciate that you were able to join us and stay, as well as to everyone here. Your reward, if you're in the room, is that we do have a small reception outside. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone at JIS for making this issue happen. And again, Rina for co-chairing, for co-editing, and Georgina as well well for your co-editing. Thank you all.